So when you think about the crust of the Earth, most people think of this flat surface. You, see, you imagine that globe that you see in the classroom and you see this flat, smooth surface across the Earth. And then you see these satellite pictures and it looks like a sphere, a perfect sphere. But remember, what you're seeing is just a two-dimensional view of something that if you get close, will look very three-dimensional. Even the surface of the ocean is not flat. Remember, between waves and the winds pushing uh, the west boundary currents, causing them to actually uplift on the ocean surface. So that means that if you actually look closely, you will see that the ocean is higher in some areas and lower in the others. And then you also have tides, which create about the same effect. And so even the oceans are not flat. And if you look underneath the oceans and you look at the actual crust, you will see that even the abyssal plain is not flat because it, it, it goes steeper and steeper as it approaches the mid-ocean ridge. And then you have the mid-ocean ridge, which is big, big folds in the surface of the ocean. And then you have sea mounts and guillots and island arcs and other things like that, trenches changing the shape of the crust. And if you look at the continents, you're going to have valleys and mountains and domes and basins and oregons and all kinds of different kinds of structures, plateaus. The surface of the earth is definitely not flat. It is deformed. But what causes these deformations it is a combination of things like erosion, weathering, uplift, subsidence, tectonic plate motions, and a lot of other things like that. And we're going to be talking about these things in this lecture series. How does the crust of the earth change with time? So before we get into that, remember that the crust of the earth is only the upper layer and it contains a brittle, brittle material called, that we actually call the lithosphere. The lithosphere in includes the crust and the upper mantle and the, really the only difference between the two of them is that the upper mantle is slightly denser and the separation line is called model discontinuity. Remember that. Now, there's also two types of crust. You have oceanic crust and continental crust, and we'll talk a little bit more about their differences throughout this video. And then underneath the crust and the upper mantle, which is the lithosphere, we have the asthenosphere, which is a plastic-like layer which flows around carrying the brittle pieces of the lithosphere against each other, past each other, and away from each other, creating tensions in the rock that causes faulting and folding of these rocks. And we're going to be talking about that in this chapter. And this asthenosphere is moving because the mantle is moving in convection cells, even though it's a super dense material, rock is still flowing higher and higher as it picks up heat from the outer core and it goes towards the surface. And then as it touches the lithosphere and it cools down, it will actually sink underneath again to restart the cycle. And so these convection cells will be working as wheels to move the asthenosphere. And, of course, the outer core is liquid and the inner core is solid because it's under so much pressure, but the outer core is liquid and transferring this heat is going to be driving all of this. And you can see all of that shown to you up there on the upper right corner. And you see the same structures that we talked about in the previous chapter showing up in this picture. Another thing you have to understand before we continue in this chapter is the idea of magma. Magma, remember, is molten rock underneath the surface of the earth and as the same rock reaches the surface it's called lava and lava solidifies to form new crust as it reaches the surface of the earth and either touches water or air which makes it cool down but this magma can become, comes all the way from the outer core seeping through cracks in the surface which we call volcanic fissures and get to the surface that's going to be important in this chapter as well another concept that's going to be important is the idea of buoyancy force versus gravity so we're talking about density and weight here, all right? Gravity is constantly pushing objects towards the surface of the Earth because remember, gravity creates a gravity well but anything that has mass bends the space-time continuum, forcing objects to fall towards it. The Earth, since it's so, it's so much more massive than anything in it, will be pulling objects towards the center of the Earth because of this gravity well. And so anything on Earth will have weight, which is the force of gravity on an object. This weight would be pressing against the surface of the Earth. And, however, any fluid will also have another force called the buoyancy force. And that force is, exists because of differences in density. Something like water, for example, will be exerting a force on a piece of ice that's floating on it. And that's because of the differences in density between the water and the ice. So the ice stays suspended in water because it's less dense than water. Now that's important because the crust of the earth is like this dense material, but it's less dense than the mantle, which is liquid-like, flowing underneath it and so this fluid mental like material which is going to be supporting the crust in a buoyancy force and as long as the buoyancy force stays the same or the weight of the crust stays the same they will stay in equilibrium but if I were to reduce the weight of the crust or the lithosphere 
or increase the buoyancy force of the, of the magma, then that would cause the crust to move upwards. Or if I were to increase the weight of the crust or decrease the buoyancy force, that would cause the crust to move downwards. And so this is everything to do about what, what the crust deforms. Remember, there's a constant balance between the buoyancy force and the gravitational force applied on the lithosphere. And changes to either one of those will cause the crust to deform. And that's why it's very important to understand how the buoyancy force works. So let's talk about that in a little more detail. When objects float, they actually don't float in the surface. Think, for example, of an iceberg. When you see an iceberg, ever heard the expression, that's only the tip of the iceberg? That's actually true. See, the density of water is very close to the density of ice. Ice is about 0.9 the density of water. So that means about 90% of the ice is actually going to be underneath the water, floating underneath it. All right? Only about 10% of the ice is going to be above the surface. This works because of the way the buoyancy works. And I'm going to explain that in a little more detail in the next picture. But the same thing is true about boats, for example. When you see a boat, it's not at the surface of the water. Part of the boat is going to be, be actually underneath the water. But overall, the boat must be less dense than water, otherwise it wouldn't flow. The buoyancy force of the liquid is going to be constantly pushing against the bottom of the boat, making it go higher because the water is more dense than the boat is. Which means although the boat is very massive, it's very long and has a very large volume, which makes it less dense than water, which is why it floats. But a part of the boat would actually be below the water level, and that's how objects float. Like this. Objects float at a ratio of what their density is to the density of the, of the fluid they're floating on. So, for example, we don't float on air because we are more dense than air. But a hot air balloon is less dense than air, and so it will float upwards in, in the air. But look at water, for example. A piece of oak sitting on the water is almost 75% as dense as water. So that means that about 75% of the oak will actually be below the water level, and about 25% of the oak will be above the water, uh, water level. So the ratio of the density of the object to the fluid that it's, it's floating on will determine how much of the object is above water and how much of the object is below water. That's because the buoyancy force will like, exert pressure on this object depending on the density difference between the object and the fluid that is floating on. And since there's a 0.75% ratio here, it will take 75% of the object to be underwater so that the ratio of pressure of the water pressure will actually act enough on this object to actually make it not fall anymore. And so that is the point at which the weight of the object and the buoyancy force are at equilibrium. Now, if I decrease the density, for example, I add less mass for the same amount of space. For example, balsa is a lot less dense than oak is. It's, it's only about 0.1 of the density of water. So that means that it, what's going to happen is that the majority of the balsa, almost 90% of it, will be exposed and only about 0.10% of it will actually be underneath the water. And as you increase the density into pine, oak, and then rosewood, more and more of the object will be below water. Now notice that since the object is denser, it's actually not going to be as thick as the other objects were. See, balsa, it takes this much space to have the same amount of mass that it takes this much space in pine, or this much space in oak, or this much space in rosewood. So the object is actually getting smaller and smaller because it's denser and denser. But what is also increasing it is the ratio of what is actually underneath over above the water. Since rosewood is almost as dense as water is, it's a 0.8 the density of water, that means the majority of the rosewood will actually be below the water level and only a little piece will be above the water level. Now, the same thing is true if, if you increase the volume. Now look at here, all of these are oak. It means that they have the same density, all right? But what happens if I make the size of the object bigger? All right? Or in other words, I get more oak. So a larger piece of oak will look as if more of it is underneath the water. But still, every single one of these pieces of oak, 25% of these pieces will be above, and 75% of the pieces will be below. But since the pieces are larger than the other pieces, um, it will look like more of it is below the water. But the ratio will always be the same if the density is always the same. And that's kind of how objects float. Why is it important to talk about that? Because as we talk about buoyancy force and gravity and weight and densities of the, of the parts of the Earth, you're going to need to understand why the Earth is deforming based on what it looks like. So, for example, the continental crust is less dense than the oceanic crust.
to understand its density differences. Look at this block of lead, for example. One meter thick, one meter wide, one meter high of lead, a block like that, will have 11,340 kilograms. So that's a lot of weight in this block of lead. To match that weight with a block of wood and make them be balanced on a scale, you will need a piece of wood that's 2473 meters wide, thick, and high. A block of wood almost 2.5 kilometers. All right? And that's incredible. Lead is way more dense than wood is. To put it in perspective in the screen, you'll be like, if lead is this, all right, you would have to have something humongous of wood to compare to it. And so, lead is way more dense than wood is. Now, the difference between the ocean and continental crust is not as pronounced. Basalt is about 2,900 kilograms per meter. Now, what that means, that's, by the way, that's what the ocean and crust is made of. Basalt is a material that's magnesium-rich because that's where the ocean and crust comes from. It comes from the mantle, remember? And so, the mantle is magnesium-rich right now, and so, the ocean and crust is typically magnesium-rich, and so, you have basalt. Now, granite, which is what the continental crust is made of, which is older material that's been around the crust of the Earth for billions of years, is about 2750 kilograms per meter cubed. And so that means that it's going to be slightly less dense, which means if you want to match the weight of basalt with the weight of granite, you will need a block not one meter thick, but 1.05 meters thick to match the weight that. So that means thicker granite matches the same slightly thinner basalt. Now that in itself explains why the continental crust is usually thicker than the uh, oceanic crust. Because remember, if the density is going to be low, lower for the continental crust, the well, same weight will take up more space with the continents than will take out in the oceans. All right? Now it also explains why oceanic crust usually subducts underneath the continental crust when they meet. When the two co collide, the densest one goes underneath. And that's why typically oceanic crusts subduct underneath continental crust, which means the oceanic crust is constantly going to be melting, but the continental crust will not. That's why the continents will not subduct and be like that for billions of years, because they don't typically subduct, unless, of course, they hit another continent. But usually when that happens, they accrete and become one larger continent. And so that's why continental crust is usually older than oceanic crust, because continental crust doesn't subduct. It doesn't get recycled. Oceanic crust subducts. Now, also notice that seawater only has a density of 1.03, which is why it's above the sediments. The sediments sink because the density is 2.4. But the sediments stay above the rock because the rock has a density of 2.9. And the rock stays above the mantle because the mantle has a density of 3.3. Of and so you see that as the density, as you go deeper into the layers of the earth, the density is going to be increasing more and more, partially because the pressure that's actually acting upon it. Remember, notice that salt water does not have a density of 1 like water does. That's because the salt is dissolving it. Now, another thing that's interesting if you need to compare this, these two crusts is that if you look at the first 50 kilometers of crust of the Earth, the continental crust will take about 35.2 of those first 50 kilometers. In other words, the mantle, the upper mantle, is only about 15 kilometers under the continental crust. But the same thing under the ocean crust will take about 40 kilometers. And the ocean crust itself is only about 5 kilometers on average because 1 kilometer of sediment will be gathered on top of that and on, on average 4 kilometers of water. Now some places have deeper water than that in trenches and things like that. And also some places have less sediment or more sediment than that. As you can see the sediment increases as you go towards the continents both because of runoff and because there's more life over there and because it's older. We talked about that in previous chapters. And the water level also increased depending on the depth of the ocean. So underneath a, a trench that will be above way more than 4 kilometers. It will get as thick as 12 kilometers. But on average, you're going to have 4 kilometers of water, 1 kilometer of sediment, and 5 kilometers of oceanic crust. And that also changes. The oceanic crust gets... Um, the density of the ocean crust will actually increase as it goes away from the mid-ocean ridge, and the thickness will also change as you go away from the mid-ocean ridge. And we're going to be talking about that in this chapter. But it's interesting to see the actual difference between the thickness of the ocean crust and the continental crust, and it's also interesting to understand why one of them seems to extend deeper into the mantle than the other one does. All right, and we'll talk about why that happens in the next video. But remember how objects float and. Density differences are, have everything to do with this, all right? So I'll see you in the next video.